Hi and welcome back to the Open Tech Lab. This is the third part in a series I've been doing where I've been doing some digging into the IT9019 media processor which powers the Lenking HDMI capture device to see if I can find out anything about how it works and perhaps how to reprogram it. Now on this board there are two processors, MU1 and U2, and in the previous videos we've been looking at ways to reprogram the firmware in U2's flash chip, but as it turns out there appears to be a checksum that protects the SMAS compressed data section of the firmware image, which prevents us from modifying it without the device reloading the firmware from a backup. So we're at a bit of a dead end with the flash chips right now, but perhaps if we can continue digging through the upgrade files in Daniel Kuchera's Google Drive repository, we'll be able to discover some more new things just from analysing the files. Now the weird thing about the Google Drive repository is that there are two sets of firmware files for MU1 and U2, and I really don't know why Lenkeng are releasing firmware files in two parts. It would seem to make more sense to have one package file that contains the firmware for both chips in a single unit. But for our purposes, that's really rather helpful because it means we can analyze the U2 firmware upgrade file in isolation. So I've loaded the upgrade file up in binviz, which is a useful website for analyzing binary files. And if we scroll down to the bottom, you can see the S media section that we were just looking at, which contains a lot of high entropy bytes, uh, which is consistent with what you see with compressed data. But if we scroll back to the top here, you can see there's a load of zeros and another section of zeros, and then some data in the middle here, and even some strings. Now, what we're seeing here appears to be a build of free RTOS, uh, a real-time operating system, and uh, I think this contains the program that's used to load the firmware into U2's flash chip. So I think the way it works is that uh, MU1 runs the web server, and it receives this image file uh, over the network, and then it has a way of directly loading this up into the RAM of the media processor U2, and then it has a way of making it reset and then run this. So I think this at the top here is an interrupt table, and this would get loaded into the zero memory address in the system, and then it has a jump, and then it jumps into the program, which is somewhere in here, and what we see here is a, an operating system and a, a flasher mixed together, and then what it does is it runs and this flasher program would take the S media section at the bottom here and copy that into the flash memory. So maybe if we do some analysis on this flasher program it will give us some more clues about the checksum or the compression scheme. Now as it happens, I'm not the first person to look into the functioning of the Flasher software. Uh, this guy Camille Trzinski, who goes by Velociraptor Online, he's also the author of the LKV Wiki, and he wrote this series of blog posts where he'd been doing all kinds of experiments to try and figure out the architecture of this mystery risk processor uh, that the instructions run on. Uh, it's nothing standard, it's a completely custom architecture. And he did all kinds of test analysis to figure out how it actually works, and just for from the binary blob, uh, from code patterns and various bits of information he was able to glean, he was able to reverse engineer a significant chunk of the architecture of the device. And he managed to decode 12 of the possible opcodes, uh, the total number possible is 64, uh, he managed to decode 12 of them. but. There are only an, another 18 unknown opcodes that appear in the Flasher firmware. So most of these opcodes are not necessary to know. And the ones he did decode account for 80% of the instructions that are actually executed. So it's absolutely amazing what he's discovered and a significant breakthrough in terms of really understanding how these chips work. But he took it even further and was able to understand the uh, calling convention, which is necessary for how C functions are called in the code, how parameters are loaded in, and how how those functions are executed, things like printf, and he even produced a hacked up version of GNU bin utils so that we have a simple disassembler that can be used to somewhat disassemble the binary opcodes. So this is an absolutely amazing piece of work. I highly recommend these blog posts. They're a great read and a significant breakthrough in terms of being able to understand how these chips work. 
Now the source code for Venoceraptor's modified bin utils is available for download on GitHub and I've downloaded it and compiled it. Now before we can use it we need to repackage the firmware update file in an ELF file. An ELF file is a typical Unix executable and the main thing is that it turns a flat binary into something that has chunks and sections and these sections are labelled which is very very useful for the disassembly to have labels on the uh, interrupt table and the code section and the S media blob at the end and, and you can also label specific addresses for certain things, which is very helpful as well. But also this is necessary in order to get object dump to actually load the file properly. So now with that firmware elf file, we can go ahead and load uh, this object dump with it. And you can see here we have the disassembly from the very first instruction in the whole piece of code. So here I have a hex dump of the firmware upgrade package and we're looking at the string section of the flasher software and the first string you can see here is task main, that's a free RTOS thing followed up immediately by SDK version with some printf text and that's the first thing it prints out the serial port when it starts followed up immediately by a load of stuff relating to flashing the flash chip and down here we even have listed out the names of the various flash chips that uh, this software supports and then in the middle here we have these strings which are particularly relevant start comparing data comparison is success and comparison is failed which is a string I'm particularly familiar with because it's what the main software prints out if you monkey with the flash chip it starts printing out comparison is failed right before it ends up reloading the firmware from the backup. So one obvious hypothesis is that it's reusing the same algorithm in the flasher upgrade package as it is in the main software to validate the checksum. So what we can do now is take the addresses of these strings, uh, for example start comparing data is at B9F52 and we can cross reference these in the disassembly. So if we go over to the object dump and type in B9F52 we can do a search and here it's got to this address here where it's loading in the value into register 3. Now in this architecture it's not possible to load a 32-bit value into a 32-bit register using a 32-bit instruction because of course there's not enough room in the instruction to contain a literal that's that long so it has to be done in two stages so up here it's loading the high 16 bits in uh, there's the B and then down here it's loading in the low 16 bits 9F52 uh, down here and that's what sets the value to be 9F52 and then intermingled in here and the ordering is a bit weird and I'm a bit confused about it but uh, we have calls to 9B960 which appears to be a puts function and this puts function is what prints the text out of the serial port when it's invoked. So what seems to happen is that it begins by printing out start comparison and then it comes down and calls this function 9B500 and based on the return result of this it uh, does a comparison and then depending on the result of that comparison it either jumps down to 9D82C uh, which is here or it falls through to here so we've got a branch here and what's interesting is that you can see these addresses here and here are the strings comparison is success and comparison is failed so pretty clearly what's happening here is that it's doing the check inside this function 9b500 and then branching off to print success or fail depending on the result. Now I've scrolled down to 9b500 and we can see a whole bunch of code here uh, which presumably is the code that makes up the checksumming algorithm although we don't know for sure because a lot of this code is made up of some of these unknown instructions which in order to understand the checksumming algorithm we're going to have to understand what these instructions do first and perhaps these are some bit twiddling instructions that haven't yet been decoded. So I think my next task is to try and do some experiments to see if I can understand the meaning of these unknown instructions and if I can do that perhaps I'll be able to figure out the meaning of the checksumming algorithm and if I can do that then I can pack and load any arbitrary firmware onto uh, the flash chip and if I can do that then Presumably it'll give us a helping hand in understanding the compression algorithm and then I'll understand everything. Simple. So the first question I want to find out is can we freely modify the flasher program without running into some other checksum somewhere? So here I've modified the firmware of the upgrade package and replaced the SDK version text with this hello string. So let's see if we can get it to print out this text instead of this text when it starts up. So here I am in the web control panel for the linking device. So let's scroll down to the bottom and I've selected the mod firmware to load into it. So let's hit upgrade and see what happens. 
So now we're watching the serial port over on the console here. It'll take a couple of seconds to do the upload. There we are, and we have the text saying hello. So this has shown us that I can successfully modify the Flasher program and there's nothing to prevent me doing so. Now, one thing that is immediately clear from the results of this test is that if you have one of these devices on your network, there really isn't anything to stop someone just hacking into it and loading any arbitrary firmware into the device. And although we don't yet know much about how to actually program these microcontrollers, by the way this is going, it looks like it's going to be found out pretty soon. So a few hours have passed and I've been messing around patching the Flasher program and I've discovered some interesting results. So here we are on the instruction set architecture page of the LKV wiki. And if I scroll down to the instruction list, uh, there are a few instructions that were known previously. But the main development is that there's a few new instructions here, uh, eight of which I've deduced the meaning of. And I've also found a large number of other instructions that seem to be reserved. And if you invoke them, it causes the CPU to crash and print out illegal instruction. So there's a few here that are still to figure out, but I'm making some really exciting progress towards really understanding what all these mystery instructions actually do. So in order to achieve this I've written a Python script to do the job and I've written a very simple assembler that I can use to assemble together opcodes for this architecture and I found that trying to do this manually and binary quickly became unmanageable and this has worked extremely well. So what it does is it loads in the firmware file from the normal firmware upgrade package with the Flasher software built into it and then it specifies the addresses of some unused space in that uh, memory that we can patch and then what it does is it loads in this printf string which we're going to make use of in a moment and this will be used to print out some hexadecimal values the results of our experimentation and then at the normal location of the software where it would normally uh, set itself up to print SDK version out on the terminal, I've patched out the code which loads up the arguments for the printf and replaced the call into printf with a call into a custom function that I've patched into some free space. And the code for that function is down here. And the way this works is it has a bit of code here which is our experiment. And then down below it, we have some code here that prints out the results. So we call printf here, which prints the results. And then after it's done that, we loop round back to the beginning of this function. So what it will do is it will run the experiment, print the results, and then loop round forever. So this will show us that we haven't crashed the system. And on a successful working experiment, we'll just see it printfing line after line after line forever. So here's the code for the experiment. So first of all, we load the number 12345678 in hexadecimal into register number two. And we save this onto the stack so that it becomes an argument to printf. And then we do the same with register three, loading in 87654321, and load that onto the stack so that it becomes the second argument. And then this is the instruction 2b that we want to test and we suspect that it is of the I type which means that it has one output register argument and one input register argument and a 16-bit literal. So what we're going to do is see what happens when we combine uh, the literal with register 3 and then we'll see what effect that has on the output register register 2. So we then save register 2 onto the stack again so this becomes the third argument to the printf and then we'll test it out and see what the results are. So let's see what this looks like in practice. Okay, so we're now ready to run the test script and so we're going to run test.py which is our assembler and it's going to give us a file called test.bin which we will load into the device. Now to save me having to click through the web UI in Firefox all the time, I've written a simple test uh, script here, CGI upgrade encoder, which uh, performs the same action as clicking in the browser, but this just saves me a bit of effort and means I can automate it better. And then we're watching the output of the serial port in the middle here, uh, and so we will hopefully be able to see the output of our experiment uh, popping up in the middle. So let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. Now we have to wait a few seconds for the uh, firmware to get uploaded into the device and for it to get loaded into the media processor CPU. So we'll probably have to wait about 10 seconds. 
And there we have the results and you can see we've got the printfs being printed out in an infinite loop. Now after a few seconds it seems like there's some kind of watchdog that kicks in and this then causes the uh, media processor to reset itself and go back into the normal state which is quite nice because it means I don't have to reset it all the time. So if we scroll back up and have a look at the results, what we've done is we've taken R3 and passed it through this register 2B and it's taken the argument OX FF FF. Now what we see here on the right is the bitwise inverse of the value here. So every bit has been inverted. So I've tried a few different values for the immediate and the way it appears to work is that it takes the immediate value and does a sign extension from 16 bits up to 32 bits. So whatever the high bit is in your immediate becomes uh, the upper 16 bits that gets combined together with R3. And so this seems to be an XOR instruction. So running a calculation in printf, you can see what we've done here is taken the R3 value and XORed it with OXFFF. So this was our literal immediate. It's done a sign extension to make it 32 bits and the result matches the output value we got in R2. So a bit more time has passed and I have fleshed out the instruction set list quite a bit more and we're now at the point where I can make sense out of this comparison function. And unfortunately it doesn't look like any checksum algorithm is implemented in this code. As far as I can tell it's just an implementation of memcomp. So rather than checking the flash chip has been written correctly with a checksum it's just doing a verbatim comparison of the image when read back with the version in the firmware upgrade package. So we're going to have to look a little bit further to find our checksumming algorithm. So it appears that this thing hasn't given up all its secrets to us just yet, but we're making some exciting progress in terms of understanding the instruction set and the ability to write our own software and run custom routines on this device is a really cool development and I think that's going to help us a lot as this project goes forward. So I'm Joel Holdsworth. If you enjoyed the content, give it a like and subscribe. And I want to thank everyone who's supporting the channel with donations. It really helps me improve the quality of the content. And if you want to donate, I've moved my donations over to Subscribestar and to PayPal. And you'll find links to that down below, along with the show notes containing lots of background information for this video. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on the Open Tech Lab.